Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Another packed episode awaits as we continue gawking at SpaceX's accomplishments with Flight 5 and the landing of the Starship and the catch of the Super Heavy. There were also seven Falcon 9 launches last week, if you lie and class Monday's Falcon Heavy as three Falcon 9s. <laughs> and there were two launches from China as well. Delays with the return of Crew 8 due to bad weather on Earth have ended up making it to the longest ever Crew Dragon mission to date, and the launch tower for Artemis 2 returned to the VAB after over a year at Pad 39B. Europa Clipper began its 1.8 billion mile journey to explore late, I mean Europa, Jupiter's ocean moon, and much, much more. So enjoy. Starship updates are still basically just everyone gushing over the resounding success that was Flight 5. Last Monday's episode came literally only one day after the flight took place, so things were still quite fresh with a fair bit of speculation about certain aspects of the mission. As the week progressed, we got more views of the booster and Ship 30, both during their historic landings and their aftermath. Well, the aftermath of Booster 12 at least. Ship 30 didn't really last that long after splashing down. SpaceX shared a couple of new unique views of Booster 12 coming down, and after settling it down on the pad, it looked like there may have been a rupture in one of the COPV tanks in one of the chines, but now we've had some closer upper images of the vehicle, it looks like this isn't actually the case, as the tank that's visible looks reasonably intact, so not sure what caused this structural damage there. Perhaps it was aerodynamic stresses or something that wasn't this specific COPV tank causing a bit of a failure. Either way, I'm sure SpaceX will conduct a thorough examination of this, as well as the rest of the booster and its engines, as they've since removed Booster 12 from the launch mount, giving us a lovely view of those engines. I particularly like how engine serial number 314 has a pie drawn around its numbering, and these close-ups from Starship Gazer give us a good view of some of the warping that some of the engines suffered. The booster was then rolled back to the production site, where it got something of a celebrity's welcome, with lots of spectators coming out to welcome it back. It's certainly in much better shape than Booster 11 during its return to Starbase. With Booster 12 gone from the launch pad, we got our first views of the chopsticks in the wake of the catch, and they appear to have held up amazingly well. I was for sure expecting the bumper pads on the arms to be a little bit damaged and likely in need of replacement, but Starship Gazer's footage seems to show that they're essentially unscathed, aside from some scratches, which would be expected. Do you think these will be replaced before Flight 6? Let me know what you think in the comments below. SpaceX did the thing that we were all hoping they'd do. They released the footage of Ship 30's flip and landing burn in the ocean. They have said that the ship landed with high accuracy, unlike Ship 29 that was 6 kilometers off target, and the fact that we have this shot from a buoy this close means that it's likely the ship was completely on target, something further supported by a tweet from senior principal Mars landing engineer for SpaceX Lars Blackmore, who posted that they hit the target. Oh my goodness, we had a lot of Starlink launches last week. In total, there was a frankly insane number of Falcon 9 rockets taking flight. We saw a whopping 7 Falcon 9s launch over 7 days, a number that I've sort of cheated to sound more impressive by lumping Monday's Falcon Heavy as 3 Falcon 9s. I already made this joke. But regardless, 5 rocket launches in one week, a week that followed the historic 5th flight of Starship, which of course ended with a catch of the Super Heavy booster, would be an unprecedented number for anyone other than SpaceX. The front cover of today's issue of Aviation Week and Space technology actually featured the catch moment for Booster 12, with an amazing photo from John Krause. It's funny to see this, and then compare it to the cover of the same magazine almost exactly 20 years ago in 2004, where they led with David and Goliath, can tiny SpaceX rock Boeing, with a Falcon 1 being worked on in the background. And I think it's fair to say that they did. Later on, both Boeing and SpaceX received the commercial crew contract, with SpaceX receiving a significantly smaller pile of money than Boeing, and not only delivered Crew Dragon faster, I mean, Boeing still don't have a successful crewed Starliner mission to their name yet, they've flown over 40 Dragon missions in total, and of course have now been tasked with bringing Butch and Sonny back to Earth on Crew Dragon after Starliner was deemed too dangerous for the job. None of last week's Falcon 9 missions were Dragon mined, though we were expecting the return to Earth of Crew 8 aboard Crew Dragon Endeavour, but this was delayed again due to unfavourable weather conditions at the forecasted splashdown site, with a new splashdown date scheduled no earlier than tomorrow at around 5pm Universal Time, and upon splashdown this will have been the longest ever Crew Dragon mission to date, due to the delays with the spacecraft's return. In the interim period between the departure of Starliner and the arrival of the Crew 9 Dragon, temporary seats were built by the crew inside the cargo area of the Crew 8 Dragon. 
wagon out of foam straps and other soft things from the station like cushions so that Butch and Sonny could return to Earth with the four crew eight astronauts in case an ISS evacuation was required. I'm sure they're glad these won't need to be used now. Here's a really cool picture shared by NASA. This is the Dragon Freedom spacecraft docked to the ISS taken from a window on Dragon Endeavour by NASA astronaut Nick Haig 258 miles above the Sunflower State of Kansas. So what did Falcon 9 launch last week? Well, Starlink, basically. And the Starlink competitor. Starlink launches are basically all the same, so I'll just lump them all together for this bit. There were three launches lifting off on Tuesday. Actually, two Falcon 9s launched on Tuesday from Cape Canaveral Pad 40 and from Vandenberg, and then another launch from the Cape's Pad 40 on Friday. All were successful and in total grew the Starlink constellation by 63 satellites in total. Starlink is at an impressive number of satellites right now. Over 7,000 are in low Earth orbit, but SpaceX want to up those numbers. A recent filing with the FCC revealed SpaceX's intentions to get regulatory clearance to operate almost 30,000 satellites in low Earth orbit, which a lot of folks are seeing as an indication that Starship is getting closer to beginning operational launches and start deploying Starlink V3 satellites, which can only be launched on Starship architecture. I'm not sure if these are just the full-size V2s which have now been renamed to give better distinction between V2 and the V2 minis that are launched on Falcon, though it's likely that over the years, enough improvements have been made to the design that it's safe to call them a sufficient upgrade over the original V2 models. Starlink, right now, is a much vaster constellation than any of its competitors. The next biggest is OneWeb, which currently has 634 satellites in low Earth orbit, a number that grew by another 20 last week, heading to space aboard a Falcon 9 on Sunday. It's kind of wild that SpaceX is not just launching Starlink, but also Starlink competitors. OneWeb didn't used to depend on SpaceX, though. It was originally launched via Soyuz, but following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, these launches were stopped, and with a lack of an alternative launch vehicle from Ariane space, launch contracts were moved to SpaceX's Falcon 9 and India's LVM3. Elon highlighted on Twitter that SpaceX had launched a competing satellite constellation to Starlink, but charged the same price as other customers, no favoritism to their own system, though obviously it costs SpaceX a lot less to launch stuff on their own rocket than an outside customer would need to pay, since they aren't needing to profit from Starlink launches, given that they're both the customer and the launch provider. After completing its seventh launch, the Falcon 9 first stage successfully landed back at Cape Canaveral, ready for recovery and reuse. You might have noticed I so far neglected to cover Monday's Falcon Heavy Europa Clipper mission, and that's because it was one of those awkward launches that happened on Monday, sufficiently before that day's Space This Week episode, so that I could cover it last week instead of today. But it was very cool, so I'll briefly cover it again. Europa Clipper is by far my most anticipated mission of the decade, as it's going to explore Europa, one of Jupiter's moons, to investigate the potential for life in its subsurface oceans, which are thought to contain double the volume of water on Earth, and thus is considered considered one of the most promising locations in our solar system for harbouring life. The mission aims to confirm that, along with studying the moon's surface composition and geological activity, and the spacecraft gets its name because, instead of orbiting Europa directly, it'll make 44 close flybys, or clips, from a highly elliptical orbit around Jupiter. This allows it to avoid Europa's extremely radioactive environment caused by Jupiter's magnetosphere. While it's great that the launch has happened now, the spacecraft won't reach the moon until the end of the decade. But I'm sure we're all happy to wait. Europa Clipper was originally supposed to launch on SLS, but due to delays with the SLS, the mission was moved to Falcon Heavy in July 2021. Now, SLS is a powerful machine, a super heavy launch vehicle, and so Falcon Heavy needed to be launched in its most powerful configuration, i.e. fully expended with no recovery of any of the Falcon cores, and further performance was gained by having it launched without any grid fins or landing legs, which is pretty standard for an expended Falcon 9. This was the second fully expendable Falcon Heavy mission after the Viasat 3 launch in May last year. While we're sort of on the subject of SLS, the mobile launch tower for Artemis 2 has been at launch pad 39B at Kennedy since August 2023, undergoing upgrades and tests ahead of the Artemis 2 launch. But NASA has shared some drone footage of it returning to the vehicle assembly building, which was recorded on the 3rd of October, atop NASA's Crawler Transporter 2. This is a positive sign of progress for Artemis 2's SLS. The mobile platform will be used in the assembly and processing, and the eventual launch, of the rocket. In addition to SpaceX, China were busy launching stuff last week. We saw two Long March rocket launches on Tuesday. 
The first was a Long March 6A that carried 18 Chief Fan satellites to polar low Earth orbit. This was the second batch of satellites for the eventual 14,000 satellite mega constellation Thousand Sails, a project started earlier this year as a rival to the Starlink constellation. The other Chinese launch last Tuesday was a Long March 4C, which launched from the Jiaquan Satellite Launch Center carrying the fifth GFN-12 Earth observation satellite to low Earth orbit. Not much has been disclosed about the satellite aside from the usual line from official sources that it'll be used for land surveys, urban planning, road network design, crop yield estimation, and disaster relief, but it's suspected that this is essentially a civilian version of the military military Yaugen-29 reconnaissance satellite. Laon Aerospace has a return to flight last week. I covered two rockets that the modern machines of today owe their existence to, the Goddard rocket and the German V2, covering the latter with the Kerbal Space Program mod completely non-aggressive rocketry, reconstructing the vehicle in both its wartime form and its peaceful role in the American bumper program, covering its dark history and the sensitive subject that was its original purpose as a vengeance weapon, and then later its historic achievements under the bumper program, becoming the first multi-stage rockets to fly. If that sounds like a fun watch, then check it out via that card on screen, as well as the other video if that looks good too, and it should, because, you know, I made it. <laughs> and now, big thanks are owed to the names on the right there. They're my Patreon and YouTube channel membership supporters, and it's thanks to them that I'm able to produce videos just like this one in the first place. So thank you all, and now the video is over.